Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Good morning. It is Sunday. This is actually my first Sunday service. Um, I'm going to try my best to get it uploaded today. With that being said, it's also going to be my first written sermon. I just grabbed a bunch of verses um, individually to help preach so I can stay on topic. I'm still hopefully going to be just preaching just so hopefully that you hear something that the Lord may be speaking to you about. But this will be my official first sermon. So bear with me. Okay, so I decided to do something, of course, that I feel that I can relate to in my season in life right now, where the Lord is speaking to me. And and for those of you who know or who don't know, Um, God likes to give us a word and we basically preach on that. So the word today, or words today is lukewarm Christians. I'm going to give you a warning right now. And the warning is, I hope and I pray that you, you don't, um, have high expectations of what this sermon is going to be like, but I pray that you would bear with me. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. This is the first sermon written. Lots of verses. I pray that you would just, you would show up. We invite you, Holy Spirit. We invite you, Lord Jesus. We invite you, Father to open up the eyes and the ears of your hearers, of your children, or those who don't know you, that you would reveal yourself to them as you've revealed yourself to me. We can't thank you enough for all of the good things that you've provided us and that you teach us. And this is just a whiff of what heaven and eternity will be like. I just want to spend this time, in this moment, right now, to thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you have done from the beginning of creation until the day that you died and until the day that you return. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. It's a little nippy right now. We are going through some dark times. We are. Not because it's dark outside. Hopefully the sun comes out. But just. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. As I draw closer to Jesus and God. Through the power of the spirit that dwells inside of me. Maybe it's always been like this, but as the veils, the scales of my eyes and my heart start to fall off, I start to realize, wow, we live in a very evil world. Maybe you're realizing that for the first time. Maybe you want to escape from that. Or maybe you want a more intimate relationship with Jesus. Let's dive in. The subject is lukewarm Christians. One of the first things I wanted to say as I would wrote this down was the Holy Bible. There's only one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, faith and baptism, doctrine. The Bible is the most offensive book known to mankind. 
Offensive, in the dictionary says, causing someone to feel deeply hurt, upset, or angry. Does the Bible make you feel angry? About just any content that you read. This is how God feels towards us. There are times when my child does something I don't want them to do and they make me very angry. I still love them, but I don't approve of what they're doing. In order to love this book, the Holy Bible, or it's God, you have to love being corrected. And to believe it, you have to humble yourself to its content on what it says about humanity, all of us, which also means you included. I don't know what I meant by that, but... In order to know the God of the Bible, which the Bible describes as there only being one God and there is no other God, all the other gods are idols, they're demons deceiving people. The Bible is the most controversial book you'll ever find and it's the most offensive one. When you go to a church, it's the most offensive thing that you'll hear. And it'll feel like you're being judged. Because you are. The pastor's job, the Christian's task, ministry, life, is to exemplify as an example to show that this world is evil. And it's not living how God has designed us to live. Everything about this world, beyond its beauty that God created, its teachings, everything is evil. And the Bible is calling, calling us out. Shining light in a dark world evil world. That's why people get offended. That's why people don't go to church. That's why people don't want Jesus. They don't want the God of the Bible. They want their own religion. They want to make up God however they feel or believe that this God fits them. This God is judging us here on earth. And whether we like it or not, when we die, we will be judged on judgment day. And whether we enter into eternal glory with him or without him is based off what he already gave us in his word. Matthew 10, 32. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. I want you to think about that for a second. Jesus is claiming that he's the Son of God, that he's the advocate, that he's the judge, that he's God. And he's saying, if you're ashamed of me here, when you die, I will be ashamed of you and you won't enter into heaven. But if you're not ashamed of me and my name or my teachings here, then I won't be ashamed of you when you die and you're judged by God. There's only one Bible one doctrine and one Jesus, one faith, one baptism. Just like there's only one of me. 
Jeremy shines. Now, if another comes claiming that they are me, then obviously they're not because there are different characters, different attributes and behaviors that I have. My, the way I speak is different. The way I perceive and think is different. You see, and God has revealed himself in the Holy Bible, even in creation of what he's really like. And for someone to contradict that, they're not worshiping the real God. They're not worshiping the real Jesus. And this is how we know. Mark eight thirty eight. If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Revelation 3, 15 through 16. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. The Lord has revealed this to me yesterday. He said, you either are in or you're out. There is no in between. You are on the process of coming into the kingdom or you are on the process of falling away from the kingdom. In the end, when it all is said and done, you will either be in or you will either be out. And in this life, we have to make that choice. Whether we are not choosing to make a choice, it is still a choice. Fence riding is still a choice. Lukewarm is still a choice. Now, how do I, or what do I mean by that? Are you ashamed of Jesus? Are you ashamed of saying that you're a Christian in front of your friends or your family or public? Are you ashamed of saying, God bless you. Jesus loves you. Are you ashamed of the Bible's words? I was watching some YouTube videos of these street preachers. And the Lord revealed to me something. In the passage, it says that Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And a lot of people, probably even his disciples, disciples were saying, some call you a prophet, some call you Elijah, and some call you John the Baptist. And he looks at Peter and he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the son of God. And he says, blessed are you, Peter, for it was not people who revealed that to you, but it was my father in heaven. A lot of people are ashamed of Jesus. And this is how you tell. They're ashamed of street preachers. Street preachers have the truth. The doctrine that they're preaching from is exactly the same doctrine that I preach from. The way they go about it may be differently. But the truth remains the same. It's sort of for me to say, this is a phone and it's black. Whereas a different preacher may say, this is a phone and it's black. Whereas another preacher would say, this is a dark phone and it's like midnight. It's the same truth, no matter how you say it, no matter what words you use, does it still preach the truth? Yes. Some other religions don't. If someone accuses me and says, Jeremy, 
these are the facts about Jeremy and it's written according to my diary or my behavior and someone else says it in a different way, it's the same thing. It's still me. You see, and Jesus wasn't looking for perfect people in the first place. He was looking for people who would acknowledge that they're sick or are sinners in need of a Savior. In the video that I watched, this young lady, as kind as she is, not everyone is called to be a street preacher. Not everyone is called to be a pastor. Not everyone is called to be an evangelist. Not everyone is called to be patient with people. You may have a gift of patience. You can, that may be your ministry, to be relational and eventually to convince people that Jesus is Lord. Whereas some people have the fire and boldness to go out in public and preach the gospel. Because we're all different. But we may not, it's not true to say for me to judge someone where they're, how they're preaching, but to judge righteous judgment being what they're preaching. Is what they're saying true? Yes. Are they going to hell if they don't repent? Yes. Is Jesus Lord being God? Yes. Is he the only way? Yes. When we look at the text of what the Bible says, we have to look at the truth, not how it's said, unfortunately. Whether someone is using the Bible to condemn, it's still the truth. The judgment may come back on them, but it's still the truth. And basically what I hear a lot is, oh, that's not how Jesus would do things. You're making it seem very condemning. You're being very judgmental. Well, you're being judgmental too in that moment. But beyond that, every prophet from the beginning of Genesis all the way to Revelation, everyone preached. And Jesus didn't use the most friendliest words either at times. He even flipped tables. He called us multiple times, you evil and adulterous generation. So we have to look past being offended and we have to look at is he or these people preaching the truth? Are what they saying true? Yes, it is. Whether you like it or not. In actuality, she was ashamed of what he was saying, this preacher. He was quoting directly from Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Then why are you ashamed of his words? Okay, let's move on. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? The Bible gives us multiple things that God requires of us. If we don't believe in the Bible, then we don't read it. And if we don't believe it, then we don't do what it says. We don't see this God. How do I know God's real? Well, if you start to obey this God, then that means you believe in him. If I was a coach, or since I'm a dad, and I told my child or student or trainee to do something, and he or she chose to do it or didn't choose to do it, based off of how they responded would be if they believed in me or what I said, they would do it. If they did not, they wouldn't do it. And this is how we know if people believe in God or believe in Jesus based off of what they do, based off of their actions. But actions can be deceiving. But they will do what the Bible says off of faith.
And God will see that. And he will reveal himself to you if you start to believe or do believe. First John 2, 15 through 16. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everyone in the world, the lust being a desire of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Love Jesus above everything. Love his word above everything. Make him the priority of your life. Don't make anything else your priority. Don't make yourself your priority. Make God your priority. Titus 1.16 They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. In other words, what I was saying earlier is people claim to know God. The Bible gives us this list of rules. And it says anyone who disobeys these things, they don't love God. They don't know God. They're lying. Do they read the Bible? No. Do they know and obey Jesus' teachings? No. Do they love their neighbor as themselves? No. Do they lie, cheat, steal, and so forth? Yes. They do everything that the Bible says is an abomination to God, is a sin against God. But they say that they love Jesus. But they say that they love God. Not the God of the Bible. Mark eleven twelve through 25. Well, Jesus curses a fig tree and clears the temple. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree in, in leaf. He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. In other words, there are a lot of people who pretend to be Christians, but they're not. Give me a second. You can pretend to be something and not actually be it. You can pretend to be rich, right? Wear nice clothes, have a big house, nice car, right? Have a bunch of ones in between hundred dollar bills and you can actually be broke as a joke you can pretend to have brand new uh, Michael Jordan shoes the latest but we know that there's a lot of knockoffs right and that's what Jesus is describing he's describing this fig tree that had leaves right it looked very healthy. It had a lot of leaves. It, it looked like a healthy tree. But when he went to go see if there were fruit on it, there was none. And what Jesus is describing, he's not talking about physical fruit. He's not talking about physical wealth, right? Physical beauty, right? Physical profit or gain of some sort or friends, right? I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of money. I have a lot of beauty. I look very beautiful. I have a lot of nice things. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about the heart. He's not talking about nice deeds. Like I do a, a bunch of nice deeds. He's talking about the truth. Many people do nice things, but don't mean it. Many people say, I love you. If that were true, then why do we have so many divorce rates in the United States? Love is forever. Love isn't temporary. Many people claim that they're your friend. If that were true, then why do we have so much disputes amongst each other? So people lie, in other words. And 
Jesus is talking about spiritual fruit. He's talking about real love for one another. He's talking about real prosperity in your heart, real joy. People have temporary, which is ultimately fake joy. Yes, you got a brand new car. Yes, you got a girlfriend or boyfriend or married or kids. Those are temporary because your kids are going to graduate. They're going to leave you eventually, you know. You may die, they may die, so forth. You know, your car eventually is going to either get totaled in some way or it's going to it's going to explode because you got to get another car. These are temporary joys. Jesus is talking about eternal joy, joy in the Holy Spirit that bears fruit, spiritual fruit, which is peace patience, love, kindness. And he's also saying that you can't get that anywhere except being attached to me. We'll get into that later. All right. Matthew 23, 51. Or Matthew 23, 5. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. In other words, like I said, self-righteous people. <laughs> Here's something that I hear a lot. If you want to go to heaven, you just have to be a good person. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing because it's terrible. It's not true. None of us are good. The Bible describes the God of the Bible Describes none of us are good. All of us have fallen short of the glory, the perfection of God. If you sinned once, according to the rules of the Bible, if you've broken any of them, you're worthy of eternal punishment, eternal damnation. Nothing you do can enter into heaven. Do will get you into heaven. Nothing. You can read the Bible from front to back. You can pray every day. You can, you can give all your money to charity. You can serve every single person you want. None of it's going to get you into heaven. So you're saying, well, why do anything then? And that's the beauty. And it's also the mystery of God's kingdom, right? Because he knew. He knew that people were going to try to earn salvation. And he knows that about you, right? You think that there's nothing wrong with you, or you think that you're not that bad of a person, but I promise you, if you knew the mystery of God, you would see the truth. So for those of you who hear it, you know the voice of God, but for those of you who don't hear it, you don't know God. You only think or are convincing yourself that you, that you do. 1 John 3, 9, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they cannot keep on sinning because they are children of God. Whew, that's a good one. You see, and that's the mystery. The mystery is when you get born again, before you were born again, baptized, you have a sinful nature and it desires to sin against God, even hate God. And that's why a lot of people don't like God. He's very judgmental. So his Christians are very judgmental. Well, yeah, because God hates sin. But when you get born again, there's like a baby spirit of Jesus lives in you. And as you read the Bible and pray every day and, and get to understand, like when you first meet someone, you don't know anything about them. And you get to learn more about them the more you spend time with them, especially if they're your spouse or going to be your spouse. Someone close to you, you don't know their favorite color on the first day. You don't know every dark, deep secret about them, right? at first, usually most people. But as you spend more time 
with them, they start to tell you their secrets. You see, and God is the same way. The more we read the Bible, dedicate ourselves, yearn and desire a relationship with him through his son, God starts to reveal the secrets of who he is. But a lot of people, they don't hold on long enough. So they wither away. They're like, oh, I don't, he hasn't revealed himself to me yet. And God can see that in you already. That's why he hasn't. He's like, because I know you're going to fall away. I know what you're going to do if I tell you my secrets. So I don't trust you yet. You're untrustworthy. So it's being able to build a relationship, build trust with God. God is fully trustworthy, fully faithful, but we are not. So he, in turn, as we grow in this relationship, we're growing into his, the new nature, the new character, not this, in the sinful man or person starts to die, but we have to be fed by his words and desire and seek him more and more. Okay. I guess I just finished on this one then. Matthew seven thirteen uh, through 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. I want you to think about that for a second. Hmm. I'm trying to come up with a good analogy for this one. I want you to imagine... Hmm. Like you ever seen like a truck, like a huge diesel truck? It can't fit in a driveway. Like it can't fit through a drive through like at a fast food restaurant of some sort, right? And that's what Jesus is describing. He's describing the kingdom of God, heaven, eternal life, glory and amazingness for forever and ever is a very very narrow door right it's sort of like an athlete right there is a goal the goal is to when i was in the military you had to pass a physical fitness test the physical fitness test consists of push-ups Men, we had to do a minimum of 50, um, I think, push-ups and I think 50 sit-ups. And we had to run a two miles within um, a minimum of 16 minutes and 30 seconds. Anything over 16 minutes and 30 seconds, you fail. And... Anything under 50 push-ups or 50 sit-ups, you would fail your physical training in order to enter into the military at the end of basic training. Now, Paul describes this and he says, we are like athletes who are training to win the golden prize. Here on earth, it's temporary, right? But he's saying your Christian walk is eternal. You're, you're trying to win eternal life and i know what you're saying it sounds like works it does but for another sake like i said it's a mystery but god explains spiritual things by using physical examples that's why he speaks in parables and if you hear god you would hear me if you don't hear god i'm sorry we're gonna have to work on that <laughs> but so it in order to make this obtain this goal, you have to meet the requirements. And if you're not striving to meet the requirements, you will fall short. The requirements are to the 
push-ups, for example, or the sit-ups or the two miles. Well, God has his own requirements, right? And he's saying, he who loves me must love me above father, daughter, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, above everything. And there are many people saying, we want eternal life, Jesus. And he's saying, you have to love me more than you love your talents, more than you love your family, more than you love any and everything. And you have to continue to love me like that every day of your life. Because that's the only way. You can't bring extra stuff into the kingdom of God. Just like when you die, you can't take it with you. What you do here on earth isn't about your possessions. It's only going to be based on one thing after you die, your relationship with Jesus. And that's going to be based on how you lived and treated people here. If you had a real relationship with Jesus, then how you treated people here will be based off of those spiritual attributes that Jesus has. You will walk and behave how Jesus walked and behaved in this life if you have a real relationship with him. But if you have a false relationship with him or no relationship with him, then you walk and behave like most people walk and behave in this world. And he's saying the narrow door is me. Jesus describes himself in a passage of being a door. And he says, I am the door. And there's no other way. There's no other God. There's no other door. No other window or nothing that you can get inside. I have to approve you to enter into the kingdom of God. He who does my Father's will will enter in, but he who doesn't will be cast away, will be left outside. You either are inside the kingdom of God or you're outside. You can't take anything else with you. The only thing you can take is God's will with you. I was trying to make an analogy and it went like this. I want you to describe or think about, I'm sorry, I want you to think about God being like, the more you hang out with me, the more like me you become. The more you open the Bible, you're saying, I want to spend time with you, God. The more you pray to me out loud, you're saying, I want to believe in you, God. And the more we spend time with someone, what begins to happen is we start to behave like them. That's just a natural thing that happens in nature. If you hang out with bad people, you become like them. You hang out with smart people, you become like them. You get influenced by who you hang around. If you hang around and read your Bible, you become like more like Jesus. It's not overnight, but you do become more like him over time, by faith. If you believe in someone, you hang out with them. If you don't believe in them, you don't hang out with them. You don't take their advice. You don't do what they say. So when we spend time with God and Christians, we become more like God and Christians. When we spend time away from them, then we become more like everything else that we do spend time with. You can see what people worship in their life. When you grow in Christ, you can see it already Oh, because they don't have the characteristics, they don't have the behaviors, they don't have the way of thinking like him. Maybe they're immature in their faith, 
and not fully grown yet. Don't be like that. Spend time in the Word of God. Spend time a lot in prayer. I heard this amazing thing. I said, pray until you actually pray. Pray until you pray. Don't just pray, okay, I said this next thing to do. No, just pray until you believe it. <sighs> prayer isn't for you. I mean, prayer isn't for God, it's for you. Everything that God gives us is for us. It's not for Him, because He's perfect. So within all that being said, Jesus wants to come to you on the last day and see if there are any qualities of Him on you. Is there any fruit? Is there any of my attributes, Jesus will say, on you? Are there any on you? Or are there attributes and behaviors of the world? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much. It's a great sermon. So filling. So good. I appreciate you helping me. And I hope and pray that if this person doesn't know you, they would desire you. And if they are lukewarm, that they would be turned back to you and remember your goodness and your discipline that is good. Can't thank you enough, Father, for everything that you are and that you can do every day. We are so ungrateful. Humble us, teach us, guide us, lead us. Show us who you are. Not who we think you are, but who you really are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.